things. <laughs> Hello, this is Virtual Newsmakers, and today we are here with Eric Qualman, who's written a new book, What Happens in Vegas Stays on YouTube. So we're going to be chatting today about privacy, privacy concerns, and the realities of digital communications today on Virtual Newsmakers with Eric Qualman. So I'm here today with my co-host Debbie Ellickson from Hello. Canada, and Eric Qualman is joining us today. Welcome, Eric. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back on the show. Yes, we are very excited about your new book. So do you want to give us a little backstory and tell us a little bit about what prompted you to write this new book? Yeah, I mean, they always say if you want an idea for a book, write a book. And so generally speaking, that's what happens. If I'm writing social nomics, that's when I got the idea for Digital Leader, the book behind me. Yeah. That I want to know, are digital leaders made or are they born? And so that's when I started to attack that book, Digital Leader. And then when I was writing Digital Leader, there's a lot of pieces about your digital reputation and a lot of aspects of massive shift in society that the privacy is dead. And yeah. that most of us don't understand that, from school teachers to soccer moms to employees to politicians. And you see it every day. Like you can pull it up any day of the week. There's going to be an example of people that don't understand that and they're making news in the wrong way. Um, conversely, there's also people that do understand it or don't, that just by luck, these new virtual tools allow you to become a hero overnight. Whether it's a homeless person that someone discovers they have an amazing broadcast voice and all of a sudden they're hired to be the Cleveland Cavaliers announcer. So the book, the impetus was I identified that, wow, I need to create a book that's kind of a rules-based book, the new rules of reputation, that what happens in Vegas stays on YouTube. You need to understand these new rules of reputation. And it's a book that you can hand to your employees and they can read it really quick. And also you can hand it. It's great for this holiday season right now because it's perfect for your kids. Yeah. You have teenagers or kids in college. It's like, here, read this book. And it's a quick read. Um, and we make it one page per rule. There's 36 rules because there's 36 numbers on the roulette table. And if you don't understand the new rules of reputation, you really are playing Russian roulette uh, mm -hmm. with your future. And wow. so that's it, at a, that's it at a very, very high level. Wow. That's a really cool way to structure a book would be, you know, just offering the best practices and guidelines. Um, I find that the older generations have a phobia of putting themselves online and, and almost a fear of what they put out there. And then the younger generations have not enough concern about what they put out there. What are your yeah. thoughts on that in terms of how to bridge those generational gaps? I mean, you're spot on because I've been, I gave 60 keynotes this year around the world and wow. in the last couple of years, been able to touch in 42 countries. But that was another reason for the book. No matter who I talked to, they had three questions and three very pressing questions were, you know, how do I lead my best life? How do I get others to follow me, either offline or online? And then third, how do I leave a legacy that matters five minutes from the day, five years, 500 years from today? And so this book is designed to be a quick read so that you can flip through the different rules very quickly um, and revisit it over the course of time. And you're right, the older generation, a lot of them go, that's why I'm not on these tools. And one of the things we start the book with is that you could think that by avoiding these that you can save your reputation, but that's not true. Is that what's called a digital shadow is what others post about you. And 92% of children under the age of two, obviously kids at that age aren't typing yet. Mine are close, but they're not typing or posting stuff about themselves. But 92% of kids under the age of two have a digital shadow. So that's an important fact for all of us, whether we're 80 or whether we're 20, is that your reputation is no longer completely in your control. And so you need to really understand that. And also understand that integrity and reputation, which used to be different, integrity used to be what you did behind closed doors, and then your reputation is what the public perceived you to be, that those are now one. Because of the 100% full transparency of our, of our society today, is that that's a massive shift 
for all yeah. of us to understand at a business and also personal level. So basically how you act behind closed doors is really um, critical and is going to almost be revealed <laughs> into with today's digital or has a possibility of being revealed with today's digital communications. Would you say that's true? It is true. I'd say if that door is closed, it's glass, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> right. Okay, I gotcha. <laughs> so if you're not proud of it, don't do it unless you are okay with it being on YouTube. Um, in which case, um, I don't know. I mean, there's people that make money at that too, I guess. Well, and, and, and this came about also with the smartphones, right? Because we have now the cell phone cameras. And I remember a few years ago working, working in the NHL with, uh, in Calgary. And there was some controversy about a couple of the players who were caught with a cell phone camera in a bar, in a local bar, smoking. And, of course, that through, went all around the Internet and people freaked out because they were smoking. Um, so <sighs> celebrities, uh, it isn't just celebrities, but, I mean, specifically celebrities and athletes, uh, have to be wary because everybody's got a cell phone camera and you have no idea who's recording you and who's not. So even right. when you're going in the Walmart bathroom shopping with your kids, somebody could have a cell phone camera on you. Well, no, it's, you're right. it's interesting that you say that because um, Mitch Jackson, who is a lawyer in Orange County, mentioned um, how our reasonable expectations of privacy changed the minute we started using cell phone cameras and videotapes. And now when we're in public, we can basically expect people to be photog photographing or videotaping us at any given time. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you look at Google Glass and wearable technology and the decrease in actual server cost, is it in time everything's going to be video filmed? Which, a lot of people, it's funny to me, their immediate reaction is, oh my gosh, my privacy is dead. You lament the things that are gone, the negative piece. But there's a lot of positive to everything being always on. One example is just with uh, children being kidnapped, is that mm -hmm. becomes greatly reduced because you do have this always on video that's happening. So I'm not going to say there aren't downsides to our privacy being dead. But there's a lot of upside, and, and the book really gives rules to make sure that how to produce and protect your best reputation. So it's produce, production and also product, protection. Yes. Psychologically, though, let me ask you this. Do you think that if we know that we're going to be on camera, video, still, whatever it is out there, that that's going to positively impact people's decisions on how they behave? I would say for the most part, yes, because you have to live your life as if your mother is watching you, which is a, a rule, rule number two of the book. And for the most part, that's a good thing for society. It's not all good because there's long-term psychological effects that we don't know what's going to happen if, if you don't have those release points to go out on the weekend and get completely drunk and get crazy and just be an alter personality. Is that where does that pent up energy or frustration go and so we don't know the long-term effects I'm not gonna say it's all fantastic but for the most part I'd say it is a positive step in the right direction yeah it's interesting that you say that about <laughs> live your life as if your mother is watching because um, I have gotten on to my own 16 year old son about things that his friends have posted that I think are not really you know beneficial to his reputation or my reputation or his father's reputation. So, and, and it, I think it even extends to um, a school reputation. I work with Culver Academies, that I'm an alumni, and okay. they're very concerned about protecting the reputation of their own school, but also the students protecting their own uh, reputations. And I think what happens is they spend more time teaching them what not to do online as opposed to what to do online to build your reputation. So your second question that you were getting is how to build a positive reputation. What are your thoughts on that? 
I mean, we go over some simple tools and tips on building your positive reputation is that if you don't post anything, if you're an avoidance person, then what you're doing is allowing others to manage the reputation for you. Ah. And so you got to be very careful. And so I'm going to use the words of someone else that I spoke with. I gave a keynote, and this person was a Chase client, and they came up to me and said, you know, what I've learned is that obviously we're human beings. We're not going to be perfect. And so the word he used was dilution, that there's going to be negative stuff posted about us, but if we're not proactively helping manage our reputation, then that's all that shows up. But yeah. if we proactively manage our reputation, that's just one small part of a story. It might be 5% of the story. And it's funny, the data even suggests that you don't necessarily want a perfect profile because it looks like it's not a real person. Yeah. And so that 5% actually helps you. And, and sometimes the negative is not necessarily negative. Like you might have a picture of yourself at a football game drinking a, a beer and the hiring manager is looking at that going, oh, cool, I like that team and I like to watch football and I like to drink beer when I watch football so I can really get along with this person. I'm going to hire them on the team. Nice, nice. So with teenagers, what would you do to, you know, advise a teenager how they are millennials, how they might better manage their reputations online. Yeah, you know, they're in a tricky spot because it's like we grew up, we were fortunate that this yep. this did not exist. We didn't have to worry about yes, this. So very so fortunate. To be that young. Thank God I'm not on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. To be that young and be able to understand that what I do today actually could affect me years from today is very tricky and so that's one of the main emphasis for the book is that there's the rules but we also give an example of a lesson that actually happened within the last two years and so I think that'll really hit home because some of them they're employees that are 50 years old that we use the example of others are athletes as Debbie mentioned and yeah. then others are 15 year olds, 13 year olds um, some doing amazing stuff like this one girl it's, her YouTube video went viral because she won a, a track race the, in that same day in the morning. She'd won the, the state championship in a certain race, and then she was in another race. And in that race, a girl fell down right by the finish, and this girl stopped and picked her up and carried her across the finish line, making sure that girl finished fur, ahead of her, and she finished last. And so how did she become famous? She wasn't famous because of when she won. She was famous when she stopped and pick this girl up because someone captured it on, on video and posted it to YouTube. So we yeah. give a lot of examples in there just so that people can, it's not like here do this and they don't listen. It's like wow, okay I didn't know the power of this. Even though I'm 13 years old, I've really now kind of a better understanding that this stuff can help or hurt me. So, so when you're looking words, at those hero moments can be captured in video too, those those moments where you just happen to step off, up and do something extraordinary can come across as well. Uh, yeah, that was a favorite part of putting the book together. I mean, just another quick example is, I mean, American football is huge in America, obviously. And so college football, Ohio State plays Michigan, and they're a huge rivalry. And so this young kid had cancer. And so he named his cancer Michigan because he's a big Ohio State fan. So he's going he's gonna to beat cancer. So it was like, I'm going to beat Michigan. And so that was fun. But then the Michigan team, the coaches, reached out to the family because of these digital tools. They could quickly find out where this family was located and said, hey, we think it's great that you're taking cancer head on. Uh, we're fired up that you're an Ohio State football fan. Obviously, we'd love if you were a Michigan fan. But for the Ohio State football game against us this year, which is the hardest ticket to get, we're giving your family four free tickets, and you're going to sit, and you can come in the locker room beforehand and afterwards. Oh, wow. Nice. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do out there. Yeah. Now, Eric, with with regards to videos, like when you're when you're trying to put some of the tools out there to to help your your own reputation, is What's your thoughts on whether you get a, you know, for companies, whether you get a professionally done uh, video or whether it's just like us sitting here having a chat? Uh, what's your uh, opinion about that? My opinion is it's all trying to figure out what your goal is. So it depends on how you're going to do that particular video. But I'm a big fan of it doesn't need to be fancy, it needs to be effective for most yeah. items. And so 
the worst thing you can do is sit there and craft up the perfect video in your mind or in the boardroom, and it never gets out, never sees the, yeah. the light of day. And so there's a good example for Planet Bike. They produce bike lights uh, for, for bikes. I happen to use one of the bike lights, and I couldn't figure out how to open the light to change the battery. And so I went to YouTube, the number two search engine in the world after Google, and Google owns YouTube. But I went to YouTube and typed in a search for it. Lo and behold, there was a video um, that showcased how to do this. Now, the marketing team must have cringed at this video because it was one of their customer service reps in the parking lot that had tattoos all over their arm. They had sort of dirty fingernails. Uh, they were talking in a monotone voice. It was poorly lit. But guess what? It's very effective. 10,000 other people like myself viewed the video. It is very helpful for us. And that company was doing the right thing. They were saying they were enabling their employees to said, if you can help someone out, go and do it. So that customer rep was getting the same question on the phone. They went out the parking lot, immediately shot this video. And so it wasn't fancy, but it was effective. Now in time, they might want to reshoot that. Uh, in a better lit location with a better voice and a better model, but uh, right now it, it does the job. You know what, though, you're bringing up something. This uh, in, this customer service rep was not being customer disservice rep, but was stepping up <laughs> and being the hero. Right. One. And number two, it if we'd rather watch rough and raw on YouTube as long as it gets a message across or you know, it gives us one of those hallmark moments like WestJet. I mean, that was extremely produced. Yes. There was an element of a lot of uh, rawness to it, too. I mean, they used Santa with a webcam. So, uh -huh. um, you, know, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for just people stepping up and being great people. Um, we're getting a question in from Tom George. He's a terrific guy from uh, Internet Billboards, which is a curation site, and he's asking, are there any favorite tools that come to mind to help assist someone with reputation management? What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, no, I mean, we list out, I think, 16, 16 tools in the book to utilize. Uh, from the most basic, Google Alerts. So sign up for Google Alerts and sign up for your name. And what that'll do is send you an, an email every time your name is mentioned um, digitally. Obviously, it works better if your name's a little more unique. Uh, but there's ways to tailor that. But that's a very helpful tool um, that a lot of people use out there. Um, and I'm just going to scroll down just so I make sure I get all the proper tools here if I have them handy in front of me. Um, another tool is Hootsuite. And so what Hootsuite will do is you can put in just the words you want to track. So I use that a lot for business, is, is, but it's also for reputation as well. Is the one thing that's, before I forget, the one thing that's unique about this book in my mind is that everyone has a reputation. So that's unusual that not everyone has something in the world, but everyone has a reputation. Uh, but Hootsuite's a very useful tool to do similar things where it's going to look out on all the social media plays out there, and every time your name's mentioned, it's going to pull it in. It's especially helpful for Twitter uh, when you're looking out there. So those are two of the, the very, very helpful tools. Uh, and if I have time here, I'll just start posting other tools here in the chat room as well. Super. That's awesome. So the third thing you mentioned was using these digital communications to leave an online legacy. And that's really... Um, that's really beautiful. I was watching the video of the 5,000 people singing to the young man who died of cancer um, in the Mall of the Americas. And he left a legacy with his song, The Clouds. Um, I believe that, that the older generations have incredible wisdom and stories to tell, you know, to share. What are your thoughts in terms of leaving a legacy? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that gets me most excited is if you look at Stephen Covey's very, very popular book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he mentions that we all want to know what people are going to say about us at our funeral. Yeah. And if you look at a lot of leadership's books, they talk about that. Now, the shift today is that we don't have to wait for our funeral. We can actually see that through a Google search, which is called a vanity search. We can just do a search on ourselves and get an idea of what's being said about us out there today. And so our legacy actually matters 
five minutes from now, five years, 50 years, 500 years now because it's in digital ink. It's in permanent ink. And so even after we're gone, we can actually have influence over others because it is a permanent stamp. Now, getting a little bit ahead of myself in terms of technology is that there's actually tools already in development and already out there to where, think about Abraham Lincoln, very, very popular figure, has a lot of sage advice, is that when he passes away, or even today, is through tools, it's tough. Like, I'm just using his as an example, but let's say, actually, let's use Nelson Mandela. So he just passed okay. away. So he's a great, iconic figure, wonderful man, and he can still contribute if we want through tools that when an event occurs next week, based on what he's produced during his lifetime, it could actually have either a Twitter account or a blog post that would put out what his take on that event would be. Yeah. Wow. So I'm kind of getting out there with some crazy stuff, but that's you can see the promise, and if it's pulled off right, there's tools already that can do that. Well, and I've got an example of 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 an of not having the legacy tool when when you're an iconic figure. In Calgary uh, this year, we lost uh, one of well, it was a local iconic figure. He was a longtime broadcaster and a longtime friend to just about everybody in the city, and he was a radio broadcaster. And there was no video of him on the internet. And wow. in Twitter, somebody asked me, do you have any, I want to hear his voice again. I want to hear his voice. There's nothing out there on YouTube except this one advertisement from a station he worked for years ago with probably a half a second clip or a couple seconds clips of his voice. So there really was nothing on YouTube with his voice to leave as a legacy and he had been in broadcasting for so you know longer than anybody uh, so the, I love the legacy aspect and I think if you don't have anything out there now you should get something on YouTube so that for that very reason yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great point really great point so every week we like to end our show with a challenge for people, either baby boomers and or millennials, for how they might um, positively use digital communications to make this shift into, you know, all these changes that are happening. Yeah. What would you challenge people to do this week that would help them move the needle on building their reputation? The best thing you can do is where everyone should start, even if you're super digital savvy. A lot of us haven't taken the time to do this. You need to write out 140 characters or less, so very short. That's like one or two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be five minutes from now, five years, 50 years, 500 years? That might take you seven or ten days to really figure out what you want that to be. Uh, a good example. So mine is I want to be a digital Dale Carnegie by helping others lead their lead their best life, leadership and legacy, God and family first. Nice. And so so that that's it. Um, and so try to figure out what you want that to be and that becomes your digital compass. And then from there you can venture out and figure out which tools to use and, and kind of do more of the tactical approach. But that's your baseline. You need to start with that and then go from there. And then your first step from there might be that you go on LinkedIn and make sure you have an account. If you already have an account It'll tell you if you had 100% profile completion. Mm -hmm. If you're not, make sure you had 100% profile completion because you get 40 times more job opportunities. And then not everyone listening to this is looking for a job, but you also get 40 times more business opportunities. So if you already have a job or run your own business, you should be on there at 100% profile completion. Okay, so build out a Twitter-sized um, personal statement about yourself in 140 characters. Who are you? Who is your core person? And start to use digital communications, video, webcasting, uh, uh, social media platforms to start to tell your story and share it with the world. Exactly. Don't forget to listen to other people's stories. The greatest gift everyone has is they all have a story, and so the gift you can give them is to let them tell the story. Very nice. Very, very nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Well. We want to wish you a happy holiday season. 
And we are looking forward to some great shows coming up next week. I want to be able to help people get your book so that they can share it with their clients or their employees, their teenage students, um, you know, children, what have you. Um, how do people get your book for the, to give as a holiday gift? No, thanks for asking. I don't know. Is the items, do they show up on the chat? Are they showing up live for the group right here? No, that, those are actually personal to us. So what we need you to do is tell us. Um, okay. okay, feel free to post any of that stuff I put in the group chat if oh, you want. That's great. Absolutely. Okay. I'm so, going to copy that right now. Yeah, feel free to post that to everyone, all, this, all the rules I was posting from the book. And for the gentleman that asked the question about privacy tools, I posted one or two in there so that he can use those as well. Uh, and I also put put a link to the book, but you can go to Amazon, whether you're in Canada or the U.S., just type in my name, Eric Qualman, E-R-I-K-Q-U-A-L-M-A-N, and the book will come up, What Happens in Vegas Stays on YouTube, and if you can, you can pre-order it right now, it goes live to full ordering next week, but if you pre-order it now, you'll get it in time for Christmas, nice. and so please feel free to check it out. It does make a great stocking stuffer, either for employees or for your family members that you're that you're a little concerned about what they're doing from a digital perspective and want to make sure that they have a great life leaving, moving forward. Yeah, these, this, this addresses, I think, a main concern that happens, I think, when um, we experience great change. And I believe that digital communications are probably the greatest change that we're, we've ever experienced in our lifetimes. It's yeah. changing everything. And, and your book is really a keystone to helping people understand that. So I'm looking forward to reading it, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be pre-ordering it today, and we'll be sharing that with other people as well as a holiday gift. So, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we thank love you, having you on. And uh, if you're ever interested in speaking to teenage groups, I have a few that might really benefit from your wisdom as well. Oh, yeah, let me know. No, I love, that's my favorite folks to talk to. It's great. Okay, great. Awesome. awesome. Well, keep us posted, and we will see you all next week. We have Kim Beasley that is going, she is a webcaster, and she is on G+, and she's absolutely phenomenal, and she's going to be helping us teach people how to best promote themselves and how to help people promote you. And then on next Friday... We're going to be speaking with the Children's Prize, who just announced a million-dollar prize to a phenomenal woman in Pakistan who is going to be using the funds to save the lives of um, infants and newborn children um, wow. through helping mothers. So both of these stories are really extraordinary, and we're looking forward to seeing you all next week on Virtual Newsmakers. And if you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, Virtual Newsmakers. See you all next week. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye.